Hello everybody and welcome to this A-level chemistry exam question walkthrough where I'm going to take a look at some shapes of molecules questions. So what I suggest you do is pause the video, have a go at the questions yourselves and then press play and what I will do is I will talk out loud about the question so you can understand the reasoning behind the answers and I'll write this thought process in blue and I'll put my answer in green so you can see what actually gets you the marks for these questions. Okay, so I'm going to show you three separate questions from different years now, and I'll take it more slowly on the first one just so I can walk you through the method nice and clearly. So this one is taken from a five mark question, which means we need to understand where our five marks are coming from. We've been given a number of different commands. We've been asked to draw the shape of two different molecules, therefore likely to be one mark each. We've been reminded to show any lone pairs of electrons that influence the shape and we've been asked to name the shape of one of the molecules and then to state and explain the bond angles in one particular molecule. So very likely to be one mark for stating and one mark for explaining. So thereby we've uncovered our five marks because in a way they've actually given us five separate commands. So to work out the shape of any molecule, you need to always apply the same methodology, unless it's one that you, you, know, you know the molecule well, and so you know to just say, oh, well, this is tetrahedral then. And so the method follows these simple steps. So first of all, you need to consider what group the central atom in this molecule is. And so if we go for NCl3 as our first example, we've got nitrogen as our central atom, and so nitrogen you find it's in group 5. And then the coordination number for this nitrogen atom is the number of atoms that are covalently bonded to it, which is three chlorines, so that gives us three. Then we need to acknowledge the charge, which for this molecule it doesn't have any charge, so we just acknowledge it with a zero there. And then we need to do a total number of electrons, and that of course is eight, just five plus three plus zero gives us eight. And then we need to divide by two to get us our electron pairs, which is therefore going to be four pairs. And then it's just a case of tracking back and looking at the number of things connected to the nitrogen again. Well, that was three. So if we've got four pairs of electrons and only three bonds, there must be, therefore, three bonding pairs and one lone pair of electrons. And then you need to, of course, remember what this sort of shape is. And that is very similar to ammonia, which has got a central nitrogen. It's got a lone pair at the top. We were told to show all of the lone pairs. And then our three bond pairs come down underneath the molecule. And we've got chlorines in each of those positions. And this is the trigonal shape, which, if you remember, is like ammonia, where you've got four pairs of electrons, but one of those bonding pairs has been replaced with a lone pair. Now it's sometimes called trigonal pyramidal and sometimes just called pyramidal. There is a trigonal planar which is why it's worth saying trigonal pyramidal. If we follow that same methodology again for this time NCl4+, plus, we'll just leave a little bit of space, so the group for nitrogen is of course still five, this time the coordination number is four because there are four chlorines attached. The charge is a positive charge and so therefore one electron has been lost. We divide that by, no sorry, we add them all together first and we get eight electrons in total, then we divide it by two and we get four pairs of electrons. And again, if we track back to our coordination number of four, that means there were four atoms attached. Therefore, what we have got is four bonding pairs of electrons. And so when we draw this shape, we know now that we're drawing the tetrahedral shape and the nitrogen is going to have one chlorine straight upwards, one chlorine in the same plane coming down, and then the chlorine coming out towards us is given the sort of triangular shaped bond and then the chlorine moving in towards us is with the dashed line. Now this is not always on mark schemes but I encourage you to always do it. Put square brackets around everything 
and acknowledge that positive charge like so. You need to memorize quite a few different bond angles, but the tetrahedral bond angle is the one that is most commonly asked for, and that is 109.5 degrees. Don't forget to put the degree symbol in there so you're demonstrating that you know that it is an angle. As an aside, the trigonal pyramidal bond angle in there is 107 degrees. Now then to the explanation of NCL4's bond angle, you don't need to say very much and it is a nice sort of um, generic response that you can roll out for any question of this nature. And this is particularly the case when they're all bonding pairs, because all that you need to say is that the electron pairs repel each other equally. And so they lie as far apart as possible in three dimensional space. And so this can be rolled out in any situation where all of the electron pairs are bonding pairs. Doesn't matter how many there are, it will always be this response. That's why this molecule is the shape that it is. OK, in this question, we are looking at chlorine containing compounds. And we've got two different questions. One is a three mark question, another is a two mark question. So if we just again unpick what we're being asked to do for this question so we can see where our marks are going to go, we've been given the command to draw the shape of the molecule of krypton difluoride. We've been asked to name the shape and we've been asked to suggest a bond angle. So that's where our three marks are going to come from. So if we just use that method that I showed you in the previous question, krypton is in group 8, its coordination number is 2 because there's two fluorine atoms attached and there is no charge for the molecule, so there is our sum. 8 plus 2 plus 0 gives us 10. And then that means we then, then need to divide it by 2, which gives us 5 electron pairs. And you can see that this is much faster than doing it in the columns and writing out all the justification for what each of those numbers means. And you can do that once you get fast at working out the shapes of molecules. So then we've got the five electron pairs. And that is the trigonal bipyramidal structure, which if I just use a little bit of space on the side here, it looks like this when it's in its entirety. You've got the axial bonds here and here, and then you've got the equatorial in this middle sort of triangle shape. Now, we have got five electron pairs, but there are only two fluorine atoms attached to that central krypton. And so we've got the krypton here, and the two fluorine atoms will occupy opposite positions like so. And so then the lone pairs will be in the middle like this. And you can draw it that way around, or you could draw it horizontally like so. It really doesn't matter. It just sort of depends what you find more comfortable doing. But the important thing is to remember all of those lone pairs. And then when you've got two bonds that are in a straight line, the shape is going to be linear and the bond angle will be 180 degrees. Just an aside about why we chose the lone pairs to be like this. When we've got the number of lone pairs that we have for trigonal bipyramidal, we want them to be as far apart from each other as possible. And so the bond angle between those two lone pairs is 120 degrees because they are in this triangle plane like so. If we had one of the lone pairs down underneath in this position, then that would give us a 90 degree bond angle between lone pairs, and that would be a lot less stable because there would be a lot more repulsion. Then if we move on to the second question, we're looking at OF2. Now they haven't actually asked us to work out the shape of OF2. They've just asked us about lone pairs, but let's do it anyway, just so we practice doing it. So OF2 has got oxygen, which is in group six, two fluorine atoms attached to it and zero charge, which gives us a total of eight electrons and therefore four electron pairs. And so we know that four electron pairs is going to be tetrahedral, which is going to be like so, but we're replacing two of those bonding pairs with lone pairs of electrons and 
the oxygen will look like this. So that's the shape if we had been asked to draw it, which we haven't. What we've been asked to say is to describe the influence of those lone pairs on the shapes of the molecule. Now this is a V-shaped molecule, and so it's not tetrahedral anymore because the lone pairs influence the shape, but they aren't included in the name. And so this question here is, is really um, quite a common question to do with VSEPR, valence shell electron pair repulsion theory. And so we've already discussed about bonding pairs all repelling each other equally. Well, what we need to say in this question is lone pairs repel more than bond pairs. And so what that does is that reduces the bond angle. And so what we need to say here is that the bond angle will be lower. And we can show off, if we like, and, and predict what that bond angle will be. In tetrahedral normally, it's 109.5 degrees, and there are two lone pairs here, and each lone pair will reduce the bond angle by about 2.5 degrees, and so that will drop us down to 104.5 degrees, which, if you remember studying this in class, is likely to be the bond angle that you learned for water. I thought we'd finish off this video by taking a look not at how to work out something's shape, but actually at the implication of a molecule's shape. And so they begin this question by telling us that silicon tetrafluoride has a tetrahedral shape. And their first command is to deduce the type of intermolecular forces in silicon tetrafluoride. And then they've got a further command saying explain how this type of intermolecular force arises and why no other type of intermolecular force exists. And once again, this is a three mark question and we've unpicked where those three marks are going to come from. There will be one mark for the deduction, one for the explanation and one for the further explanation as we've annotated here. And so silicon tetrafluoride is tetrahedral. So let's draw it out. No credit here, but silicon tetrafluoride will look like this. Now we know that fluorine is the most electronegative atom that there is. And so all of these bonds between the silicon and the fluorine will be polar bonds because the fluorine pulls electrons towards itself. And this will be electron rich and that will be electron deficient. However, because this molecule is perfectly symmetrical, all of these dipoles are going to cancel each other out. And so whilst there will be polar bonds in this molecule, the molecule itself is going to be non-polar. And so therefore, there will not be any permanent dipole-dipole attractions between silicon tetrafluoride molecules. And so the only intermolecular force that will exist between these molecules will be van der Waals forces. And then for our explanation marks, we just need to give one mark as to why these van der Waals forces arise. And so what you get is you get uneven distribution of electrons in one molecule inducing or causing a dipole to arise in a neighbouring molecule. And now on to the final mark. I've already explained why no other type of intermolecular force exists. So what do you need to write down to get the mark? Well, you just need to write down that it is a symmetrical molecule. And that's all you need to say to get yourself the mark. Or you could say that these dipoles cancel each other out. Either of those is absolutely fine for that final mark. Okay, that's the end of this video. I'll see you again soon. Goodbye.